Care Hardy, James Care Hardy, 15 August 1856, 26 September 1915, was a Scottish trade unionist and politician. He was a founder of the Labour Party and served as its first parliamentary leader from 1906 to 1908. Hardy was born in Newhouse, Lanarkshire. He started working at the age of seven and from the age of ten worked in the Lanarkshire coal mines. With a background in preaching, he became known as a talented public speaker and was chosen as a spokesman for his fellow miners. In 1879, Hardy was elected leader of a miners' union in Hamilton and organized a national conference of miners in Dunfermline. He subsequently led miners' strikes in Lanarkshire 1880 and Ayrshire 1881. He turned to journalism to make ends meet, and from 1886 was a full-time union organizer as secretary of the Ayrshire Miners' Union. Hardy initially supported William Gladstone's Liberal Party, but later concluded that the working class needed its own party. He first stood for Parliament in 1888 as an independent, and later that year helped form the Scottish Labour Party. Hardy won the English seat of West Ham South as an independent candidate in 1892 and helped to form the Independent Labour Party ILP the following year. He lost his seat in 1895, but was re-elected to Parliament in 1900 for Mer the Titfill in South Wales. In the same year, he helped to form the union-based Labour Representation Committee, which was later renamed the Labour Party. After the 1906 election, Hardy was chosen as the Labour Party's first parliamentary leader. He resigned in 1908 in favor of Arthur Henderson and spent his remaining years campaigning for causes such as women's suffrage, self-rule for India, and opposition to World War I. War I. He died in 1915 while attempting to organize a pacifist general strike. Hardy is seen as a key figure in the history of the Labour Party and has been the subject of multiple biographies. Kenneth O. Morgan has called him Labour's greatest pioneer and its greatest hero. Early Life James Kerr Hardy was born on 15 August 1856 in a two-roomed cottage on the western edge of Newhouse, Lanarkshire near Holitown, a small town close to Motherwell in Scotland. His mother, Mary Kerr, was a domestic servant, and his stepfather, David Hardy, was a ship's carpenter. Hardy had little or no contact with his biological father, a miner from Lanarkshire named William Aitken. The growing family soon moved to the shipbuilding burg of Govan near Glasgow, which wasn't incorporated into the city, until 1912, where they made a life in a very difficult financial situation, with his stepfather attempting to maintain continuous employment in the shipyards rather than practicing his trade at sea never an easy proposition given the boom and bust cycle of Hardy's first job came at the very young age of seven, when he was put to work as a message boy for the Anchor Line Steamship Company. Formal schooling henceforth became impossible, but his parents spent evenings teaching him to read and write skills which proved essential for future self-education. A series of low-paying entry-level jobs followed for the boy, including work as an apprentice in a brass-fitting shop, work for a lithographer employment in the shipyard's heating rivets, and time spent as a message boy for a baker for which he earned four shillings and sixpence a week. A great lockout of the Clydeside shipworkers took place in which the unionized workers were sent home for a period of six months. With their main source of income terminated, the family was forced to sell all their possessions to pay for food, with Hardy's meager earnings the only remaining source of income for the household. One sibling took ill and died in the miserable conditions which followed, while the pregnancy of his mother limited her own ability to work. Making matters worse, Young James lost his job for turning up late on two occasions. In desperation, his stepfather returned to work at sea, while his mother moved from Glasgow to Newart Hill, where his maternal grandmother still lived. At the age of ten years old, Hardy went to work in the mines as a trapper opening and closing a door for a ten-hour shift in order to maintain the air supply for miners in a given section. Hardy also began to attend night school in Holotown at this time. 
Hardy's stepfather returned from sea and went to work on a railway line being constructed between Edinburgh and Glasgow. When this job was completed, the family moved to the village of Quarter, Lanarkshire, where Hardy went to work as a pony driver at the mines, later working his way into the pits as a hewer. He also worked for two years above ground in the quarries. By the time he was twenty, he had become a skilled practical miner. Care, as he was now called, longed for a life outside the mines. To that end, encouraged by his mother, he had learned to read and write in shorthand. He also began to associate with the Evangelical Union, becoming a member of the Evangelical Union Church, Park Street, Hamilton, now the United Reformed Church, Hamilton, which also incorporates St. James Congregational Church, attended by the young David Livingstone, the future famous missionary explorer, and to participate in the temperance movement. Hardy's avocation of preaching put him before crowds of his fellows, helping him to learn the art of public speaking. Before long, Hardy was looked to by other miners as a logical chairman for their meetings and spokesman for their grievances. Mine owners began to see him as an agitator, and in fairly short order, he and two younger brothers were blacklisted from working in the local mining industry. Union Leader The 23-year-old Care Hardy moved seamlessly from the coal mines to union organization work. In May 1879, Scottish mine owners combined to force a reduction of wages, which had the effect of spurring the demand for unionization. Huge meetings were held weekly at Hamilton as mine workers joined to vent their grievances. On 3 July 1879, Care Hardy was appointed corresponding secretary of the miners, a post which gave him opportunity to get in touch with other representatives of the mine workers throughout southern Scotland. Three weeks later, Hardy was chosen by the miners as their delegate to a national conference of miners to be held in Glasgow. He was appointed miners' agent in August 1879, and his new career as a trade union organizer and functionary was launched. On 16 October 1879, Hardy attended a national conference of miners at Dunfermline, at which he was selected as national secretary, a high-sounding title which actually preceded the establishment of a coherent national organization by several years. Hardy was active in the strike wave which swept the region in 1880, including a generalized strike of the mines of Lanarkshire that summer which lasted six weeks. The fledgling union had no money, but worked to gather foodstuffs for striking mine families, as Hardy and other union agents got local merchants to supply goods upon promise of future payment. A soup kitchen was kept running in Hardy's home during the course of the strike, manned by his new wife, the former Lily Wilson. While the Lanarkshire mine strike was a failure, Hardy's energy and activity shone, and he accepted a call from Ayrshire to relocate there to organize the local miners. The young couple moved to the town of Cumnock, where Care set to work organizing a union of local miners, a process which occupied nearly a year. In August 1881, Ayrshire miners put forward the demand for a 10% increase in wages a proposition summarily refused by the region's mine owners. Despite the lack of funds for strike pay, a stoppage was called and a ten-week shutdown of the region's mines ensued. This strike also was formally a failure, with miners returning to work before their demands had been met, but not long after the return wages were escalated across the board by the mine owners, fearful of future labor actions. One of the other leaders of the strike was 19-year-old miner Andrew Fisher, who decades later would become leader of the Australian Labour Party and Prime Minister of Australia. He and Hardy met regularly to discuss politics when they both lived in Ayrshire, and would renew their acquaintance on a number of occasions later in life. To make ends meet, Hardy turned to journalism, starting to write for the local newspaper, the Cumnock News, a paper loyal to the pro-Labour Liberal Party. As part of the natural order of things, Hardy joined the Liberal Association in which he was active. He also continued his temperance work as an active member of the local Good Templars Lodge. In August 1886, Hardy's ongoing efforts to build a powerful union of Scottish miners were rewarded when there, 
was formed the Ayrshire Miners Union. Hardy was named organizing secretary of the new union, drawing a salary of 75 pounds per year. In 1887, Hardy launched a new publication called The Miner. Scottish Labour Party Hardy was a dedicated Georgist for a number of years and a member of the Scottish Land Restoration League. It was through the single tax on land monopoly that Hardy gradually became a Fabian socialist. He reasoned that whatever the idea may be, state socialism is necessary as a stage in the development of the ideal. Despite his early support of the Liberal Party, Hardy became disillusioned by William Ewart Gladstone's economic policies and began to feel that the Liberals would not advocate the interests of the working class. Hardy concluded that the Liberal Party wanted the workers' votes without in return the radical reform he believed to be crucial he stood for Parliament. In April 1888, Hardy was an independent Labour candidate at the mid Lanarkshire by election. He finished last but he was not deterred by this and believed he would enjoy more success in the future. At a public meeting in Glasgow on 25 August 1888, the Scottish Labour Party, a different party from the 1994 created Scottish Labour Party, was founded, with Hardy becoming the party's first secretary. The party's president was Robert Bonteen Cunningham Graham, the first socialist MP and later founder of the National Party of Scotland, forerunner to the Scottish National Party. MP for West Ham South Hardy was invited to stand in West Ham South in 1892, a working-class seat in Essex, now Greater London. The Liberals decided not to field a candidate, but at the same time not to offer Hardy any assistance. Competing against the Conservative Party candidate, Hardy won by 5,268 votes to 4,036. He was variously described as the Labour or Liberal, and Labour candidate. Upon taking his seat on 3 August 1892, Hardy refused to wear the parliamentary uniform of black frock coat, black silk top hat and starched wing collar that other working class MP wore. Instead, Hardy wore a plain tweed suit, a red tie and a deer stalker. Although the deer stalker hat was the correct and matching apparel for his suit, he was nevertheless lambasted in the press and was accused of wearing a flat cap, headgear associated with the common working man cloth cap in Parliament. In Parliament, Hardy advocated a graduated income tax, free schooling pensions, the abolition of the House of Lords and for women's right to vote. Independent Labour Party In 1893, Hardy and others formed the Independent Labour Party, an action that worried the Liberals, who were afraid that the ILP might, at some point in the future, win the working class votes that they traditionally received. Hardy hit the headlines in 1894, when after an explosion at the Albion Colliery in Silphanid near Pontypridd, which killed 251 miners, he asked that a message of condolence to the relatives of the victims be added to an address of congratulations on the birth of a royal heir, the future Edward Roman VIII. The request was refused, and Hardy made a speech attacking the monarchy, which almost predicted the nature of the future king's marriage, which caused his abdication. From his childhood onward this boy will be surrounded by sycophants and flatterers by the score cries of oh, oh, and will be taught to believe himself as of a superior creation. Cries of oh, oh, a line will be drawn between him and the people whom he is to be called upon some day to reign over. In due course, following the precedent, which has already been set, he will be sent on a tour round the world, and probably rumors of a morganatic alliance will follow loud cries of oh, oh, and order, and the end of it all will be that the country will be called upon to pay the bill. Cries of divide. This speech in the House of Commons was highly controversial and contributed to the loss of his seat in 1895. Labour Party. Hardy spent the next five years of his life building up the labor movement and speaking at various public meetings. He was arrested at a women's suffrage meeting in London, but the Home Secretary, concerned about arresting the leader of the ILP, ordered his release. In 1900, Hardy organized a meeting of various trade unions and socialist groups. They agreed to form a labor representation committee, and so the Labor Party was born. 
Later that same year, Hardy, representing Labour, was elected as the junior MP for the dual member constituency of Murgatidville in the South Wales Valleys, which he would represent for the remainder of his life. Only one other Labour MP was elected that year, Richard Bell for Derby. But from these small beginnings, the party continued to grow, forming the first ever Labour government in 1924. Meanwhile, the Conservative Unionist government became deeply unpopular, and Liberal leader Henry Campbell Bannerman was worried about possible votes splitting across the Labour and Liberal parties in the next election. A deal was struck in 1903, which became known as the Lib Lab Pact of 1903, or Gladstone MacDonald Pact. It was engineered by Ramsay MacDonald and Liberal Chief Whip Herbert Gladstone. The Liberals would not stand against Labour in 30 constituencies in the next election, in order to avoid splitting the anti-conservative vote. In 1905, Hardy served as an LRC election agent for William Walker, who came close to victory with 48.5% of the vote in Belfast North. Despite his own support for Irish home rule, Hardy, who made repeated visits, appeared determined to treat Belfast as a typical British city, confident that class politics could surmount sectarian division over the constitutional question. In 1906, the LRC changed its name to the Labour Party. That year, the newly established Liberal government of Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman called a general election resulting in a heavy defeat for the Conservative Party then in opposition, and the landslide affirmation of the Liberals. The 1906 general election result was one of the biggest landslide victories in British history. The Liberals swept the Conservatives and their Liberal Unionist allies out of what were regarded as safe seats. Conservative leader and former Prime Minister Arthur Balfour lost his seat, Manchester East, on a swing of over 20 percent. What would later turn out to be even more significant was the election of 29 Labour MP. In January 1907, at the Labour Party's first annual conference, held in Belfast, Hardy helped raise the issue of whether sovereignty lay with the annual conference, as in the inherited tradition of trade union democracy, or with the PLP. In the closing session, he shocked the delegates by threatening to resign from the PLP over an amendment to a resolution on equal suffrage for women that would have bound him as an MP to oppose any compromise legislation that. This he saw as potentially delaying the extension of citizenship to women, on which he spoke passionately, I thought the days of my pioneering were over, but of late I have felt, with increasing intensity, the injustice inflicted on women by our present laws. The party is largely my own child, and I cannot part from it lightly or without pain, but at the same time, I cannot sever myself from the principles I hold. If it is necessary for me to separate myself from what has been my life's work, I do so in order to remove the stigma resting upon our wives, mothers, and sisters of being accounted unfit for citizenship. The PLP diffused the crisis by allowing Hardy to vote, as he wished on the subject. The precedent became the basis of a conscience clause in its standing orders, and would be invoked by party leader Michael Foote in 1981 to argue that the will of the conference should not always bind the PLP Hardy. He was replaced by Arthur Henderson. Racist Remarks Care Hardy, in his evidence to the 1899 House of Commons Select Committee on Emigration and Immigration, argued that the Scots resented immigrants greatly and that they would want a total immigration ban. When it was pointed out to him that more people left Scotland than entered it, he replied, it would be much better for Scotland if those 1,500 were compelled to remain there and let the foreigners be kept out. Dr. Johnson said God made Scotland for Scotchmen, and I would keep it so. According to Hardy, the Lithuanian migrant workers in the mining industry had filthy habits, they lived off garlic and oil, and they were carriers of the Black Death. In 1908, when visiting South Africa, he said the socialist movement stood for equal rights for every race, but that we do not say all races are equal, no one dreams of doing that. On return to the UK, he stated his belief that black people should be given the opportunity to vote 
and to take a full part in society. Later career After resigning the leadership of the party in 1908, Hardy devoted himself to campaigning for votes for women and developing a closer relationship with Sylvia Pankhurst. His secretary, Margaret Simmons Travers, was the first woman to speak in the Houses of Parliament when she tricked her way in on 13 October 1908. He also campaigned for self-rule for India and an end to segregation in South Africa. During a visit to the United States in 1909, his criticism of sectarianism among American radicals caused intensified debate regarding the American Socialist Party possibly joining with the unions in a Labour Party. A pacifist, Hardy was appalled by the First World War, and along with socialists in other countries, he tried to organize an international general strike to stop the war. His stance was not popular, even within the Labour Party, but he continued to address anti-war demonstrations across the country and to support conscientious objectors. After the outbreak of war, on 4 August 1914, Hardy's spirited anti-war speeches often received opposition in the form of loud heckling. Hardy was among many Scottish socialists, the likes of John MacLean and Willie Gallasher, who opposed the war and believed that working-class men fighting other working-class men only served the interests of capitalism. Despite this, once the war had started, Hardy seems to have resigned himself to the inevitability of pursuing it rather than stopping it immediately. In a full-page article in the Murtha Pioneer on 28 November 1914, he wrote, May I once again revert for a moment to the ILP pamphlets. None of them clamor for immediately stopping the war. That would be foolish in the extreme, until, at least, the Germans have been driven back across their own frontier, a consummation which, I fear, carries us forward through a long and dismal vista. In the same article, he also opposed accusations that he was unpatriotic by claiming that his meetings encouraged young men to enlist while those of his liberal opponents did the opposite. I have never said or written anything to dissuade our young men from enlisting. I know too well all there is at stake. Judging by their speeches, they seem far more concerned about defeating me than about defeating the Kaiser. After a series of strokes, Hardy died in hospital in Glasgow of pneumonia at noon on 26 September 1915, aged 59. His friend and fellow pacifist Thomas Evan Nicholas Nicholas Wiglis delivered the sermon at Hardy's memorial service at Aberdare in his constituency. He was cremated in Mary Hill, Glasgow. A memorial stone in his honor is at Cumnock Cemetery, Cumnock, Ayrshire. Legacy on 2 December 2006, a memorial bust of Care Hardy was unveiled by Sinon Valley MP and clued outside council offices. The ceremony marked a centenary since the party's birth. Hardy is still held in high esteem in his old hometown of Holotown, where his childhood home is preserved for people to view while the local sports center was named in his own honor as the Care Hardy Sports Center. Care Hardy Memorial Primary School opened in 1956, named Fortham. There are now 40 streets throughout Britain named after Hardy. Alan Morrison has, in turn, used the title Care Hardy Street for his 2010 narrative long poem in which a fictitious, turn-of-the-century, working-class poet discovers a socialist utopia off the dreamt-up sea green line of the London Underground. One of the buildings at Swansea University is also named after him, while a main distributor road in Sunderland is named the Care Hardy Way. The Ellen Wilkinson Estate in Wardley, East Gateshead once in the urban district of Felling, subsumed by Gateshead Metropolitan Borough in 1974, has Care Hardy Avenue as its main street. Every other street is named after a premonis 1,960 Labour MP. The England footballer Chris Waddle, lived in number one Care Hardy Avenue, Gateshead, between 1971 and 1983. The Care Hardy estate in Canning Town, Newham, East London, is named after him as a legacy to his tenure as MP for West Ham South, Newham. Care Hardy Avenue in the town of Cletermore, Cumbria, has been named after him since 1934. Furthermore, an estate in the London borough of Brent was also named after Hardy.
Care Hardy Crescent in Kilwinning in Scotland is named after him, as is a block of apartments in Little Thurrock. There is also a Care Hardy Street in Greenock and a Care Hardy Street in Methil, Fife, a predominantly labour stronghold. Ty Care Hardy, in his constituency town of Merthyr Tydfil, housed offices for Merthyr Tydfil County Borough Council and adjoins the Civic Centre on Castle Street. In Merthyr Tydfil, there is also a Care Hardy estate with streets named after prominent early independent labour leaders such as Wallhead and Glacier. In recognition of his work as a lay preacher, the Care Hardy Methodist Church in London bears his name. Labour founder Care Hardy has been voted the party's greatest hero in a straw poll of delegates at the 2008 Labour Conference in Manchester. Labour peer Lord Morgan, Ed Bowles, David Blunkett and Fiona MacDegart argued the case for four Labour figures at a Guardian Fringe meeting at the Labour Conference 2008 in Manchester, 23 September 2008. Care Hardy's younger half-brothers David Hardy, George Hardy and sister-in-law Agnes Hardy all became Labour Party members of Parliament after his death. His daughter Nan Hardy and her husband Emrise Hughes both became Provost of Cumnock. Biographer Kenneth O. Morgan has sketched Hardy's personality. I found him a man who was not only an idealistic crusader, but a pragmatist, anxious to work with radical liberals whose ideology he largely shared, subtle in building up the labor alliance with the trade unions and the other socialist bodies, and supremely flexible in his political philosophy a very generalized socialism based on a secular socialists he proclaimed made war on a system not a class the class the class the class the class on a system not a class class the class the class he was no economist and was ill-informed on many issues but he had uniquely the charisma and vision that any radical movement needs. Kerr Starmer, the current leader of the Labour Party and serving MP in the House of Commons for Holborn and St Pancras, was named after Hardy. He said he was very fond of the name. Kerr Hardy Society On 15 August 2010, the 154th anniversary of Hardy's birth, the Kerr Hardy Society was founded at Summerley, Museum of Scottish Industrial Life. The Society aims to keep alive the ideas and promote the life and work of Care Hardy. Among the co-founders was Cathy Jamison, who at the time was the MSB for the constituency of Carrick, Cumnock and Dune Valley, which covers the area where Hardy lived most of his life. Scottish Labour leader Richard Leonard was the main founder of the Society, along with Hugh Gaffney MP. In other media, in August 2016, Jim Kenworth's play A Splotch of Red, Care Hardy in West Ham, was premiered at various venues in New Ham, including Neighbours Hall in Canning Town at which Hardy spoke. The play deals with Hardy's battle to win the constituency of West Ham South. It was directed by James Martin Charlton. Samuel Casely played Care Hardy. Works From Serfdom to Socialism 1907 Karl Marx, The Man and His Message, 1910. Care Hardy, 1907. Women and Politics. The Case for Women's Suffrage, 7883. Wikidata Cone, 107,177,756.